It's Wolf, and I just recently finished playing through Spongebob Battle for Bikini Bottom Rehydrated. This is a remaster of the PS2 era game. That's the console I owned it on. Anyway, the PS2 era game, Battle for Bikini Bottom, really cool game. This is almost like an exact remake, pretty much. It looks really good. Anyway, blah, blah, blah. That's not the game we're going to talk about today, but it's a cool game, despite some of the negative reviews. I think it's really cool and worth checking out if you like Spongebob or like the original Battle for Bikini Bottom. Anyway, though... One one of the things that sort of stinks about Battle for Bikini Bottom as a game is that even though it's kind of the only like real 3D representation we have of the world of Spongebob, you don't actually get to interact with it that much because Spongebob is too preoccupied battling the robots and stuff. So like you get to see these areas, but there's, you know, they're, they're, they feel like levels in a video game. You can't just, like, like I said, interact with stuff. You can't, like, talk with characters or anything outside of, like, generic sort of repeated quotes after you've finished missions and stuff like that. And also, as a platformer, some of the areas don't necessarily look realistic because they have to be, you know, a platforming challenge also. So that had me thinking, what SpongeBob games do I know of that do allow more sort of normal interaction that aren't at all combat-based or anything? Anything. And the answer is, some of the PC Spongebob games, in particular the one that popped into my mind and the one that I'm going to be showing in this video, is Spongebob Employee of the Month. Now, I own a number of Spongebob PC games, at least three, but I think I might own even more. And I got most of them when I was a little kid, and I remember just really enjoying them. A lot of them are pretty short, can be finished in just like a couple hours, but they have replayability because they are pretty fun, and because there's a lot of stuff to just kind of explore. The only issue, though, is that I don't really have anything to play these on per se. Now I could try to play them on my normal PC which I've shown in videos and stuff before. It's a Dell Inspiron 15 7000 gaming. Really nice computer. Use it for literally everything on the channel. But it runs Windows 10 and it's so modern that I kind of feel like it might have some issues running these older games because I mean Employee of the Month is from 2002 so that's like 18 years ago. And also my computer has like no space ever on it because I'm always doing videos and stuff so I didn't really want want to try to install it on here, but it popped into my mind. I do have another computer that I could use for this. This is my old Acer Aspire V5. I owned this for pretty much the entirety of high school and the beginning of college. Actually, a couple of the first videos uploaded on this channel were made on this computer, and it's a, it was a pretty good computer, but it wasn't at all really like a gaming computer. It didn't have a graphics card. It had an i3, which like at the time wasn't bad, but without a graphics card, it really couldn't do much of anything. It could play like older games, but that was about it. But in this scenario, that's pretty much exactly what we need. However, there's one other issue with it. As you guys can tell, it doesn't have a screen. See, what happened and the reason I stopped using it was that my cat one day knocked it off of a counter and the screen broke. So I was gonna get a replacement screen for it, but I never got around to it. Already had my new computer by then and everything. So it just kind of sat around for a while. And I did keep it because I was like, I can still use it with an external display and eventually I did just remove the screen from it entirely like including the backplate and everything because I figured I was never actually going to replace a screen I could just use it with an external display. Only issue is when I removed the screen Windows decided to pretty much throw a fit with that and it won't really like it never after I removed the screen it like never would boot into Windows. I don't know what it was doing what its issue was with that but it wouldn't work. However Linux still works on it. Linux works on it perfectly fine but then that leaves us with the issue of how are we going to play Windows games on a Linux computer and that's where Wine comes in. So anyway, I think you guys can probably understand where the video is going by now. So let me just show you guys what I did. Also, I just want to say this isn't really so much of a tutorial, but more of just a kind of here's the thing that I did sort of thing. But I'm going to sort of try to explain the steps along the way in case you happen to want to try it for yourself. But this I, I really wouldn't consider this a tutorial at all. Now, just a heads up, I'm recording this audio after the fact. So it's not live so there might be some points where it doesn't like perfectly match up but I just figured it would be easier for me to record everything without dealing with trying to think of commentary along the way and then record the commentary afterwards. So first thing I had to do was I hopped onto my normal computer and well we need a 
Linux distro. So I went with Ubuntu just because that's like the most often mentioned Linux distribution that I ever hear about. So went to the Ubuntu website, pretty straightforward, just downloaded the ISO from there. It's free because so far as I know, all Linux distros are free. And then the next thing was to make a live USB. So in order to do that, I used this program called Bellina Etcher. It makes making live USBs actually really, really straightforward. And I was always kind of scared to do anything with Linux or anything before hearing about this program because it always seemed like kind of a pain to make a live USB or a live CD, but this program makes it really easy. So downloaded the ISO file and then opened up Belina Etcher, put in my little flash drive. I only used a four gigabyte one on here because you don't really need that much space on a flash drive, it seems like, to, for most Linux distros really. And Ubuntu is only like a little over two gigabytes. So Etcher recognized the flash drive, went in and selected the ISO from in my downloads, and it started doing its thing. So I waited for that to go and do its thing, and then we had our live USB. The next part was to actually install Ubuntu on the computer. So I originally recorded this, and this is kind of a hint at a later issue that I ran into in the video because I had to record this multiple times. I originally recorded this with just like my camera aimed at the screen because I didn't think that it would work with a capture card, but I had to record, so re-record anyway, so then I did try it with a capture card. So never mind the camera pointing at screen footage. Here's some actual footage of, you know, the screen getting recorded with the capture card so it looks all nice and clean. So so what I did was just kind of slid my hand across the function section of the keyboard because that's how you get into the BIOS of pretty much every motherboard of any computer. Just hit one of those function keys. You can look up which one it is or you can just press all of them. So I did that. It launched into the BIOS. Then I went over into the boot order thing, made sure to have the USB drive be the first thing it tried to boot from. And then as you guys can see here, I actually already had Ubuntu installed at this point, but I was reinstalling, but it's the same process anyway. So make sure the USB is first in the boot order and then pretty much exit out and I don't even think you have to restart I believe it'll just boot into that right afterwards anyway and then the little thing launched up as to like what I want it to do so then boot into Ubuntu and then the screens come up well the screen comes up that asks you do you want to try Ubuntu out from your live USB or your live CD or do you want to install it I want to install it so hit install and from there it's pretty straightforward it's like installing really anything else it asks you some questions about like what keyboard do you use what time zone are you in? And then connect to Wi-Fi, this and that. I would heavily suggest connecting to Wi-Fi when you are installing Ubuntu, because even though it might seem a little bit of pain to like have to go find your Wi-Fi password or whatever, or just connect to internet or through ethernet. Anyway, I would heavily suggest that you do connect to the internet while you install, because then it updates for you. And I think that one of the times that I was having issues later on in the video or later on in the process was because I didn't do that at first. So like I said, would suggest to do the Wi-Fi thing and then have those updates install while you're installing it anyway. After that, I went ahead and fixed a couple audio things because the audio was still coming through like the laptop speakers. I wanted it to come through the TV speakers because I actually use a TV as a monitor, which I know is like heresy to some people, but I like having all the inputs that most TVs have. So I have a smaller TV that used to be my main TV and I it's the TV that I use at college, but I was using it as my monitor in this scenario. Anyway, that's beside the point. Fix the audio stuff. And then now it's time to install Wine. Now here is where we get really Linuxy with it because I had to type a lot of things and I just what can can somebody please just give Linux more clickable buttons because it is this is one of the main things that makes Linux so confusing and like so scary to people is like the command line usage because if you screw something up it can screw up the whole process and anyway just somebody please make a Linux distro with more buttons but anyway so I went to the wine HQ website and that was the version of wine because I guess there's also a bajillion version of the wine or something I don't know there's there's so much stuff in Linux that is like really hard to understand because it's like all documented places, but it's like all words and no pictures. So anyway, decided to go for the YNHQ version because they had an exact tutorial on how to install it on Ubuntu 20.04, which is the version of Ubuntu that I'm using. So I just followed that process. It's really straightforward on the website. Had to go through, do everything. I just, I don't even know, like, I don't even know if you had to do all the steps, but I did all of them to install it. Eventually Wine will finally start installing and you'll get a 
the little progress bar, it'll finish installing, and then it's like, oh, what do I do now? Because it also doesn't give you an icon. So now you have Wine installed on your computer, despite the fact there's not actually really any traces that you've installed Wine. So the next thing I had to do from there was go to, I had to use terminal and do Wine CFG, which is Wine config. That is pretty much a necessary step before you do anything else, because this is like, I don't know if it like checks or whatever. Anyway, it's important because it's like finishing the setup. So anyway, Wine config, open that. It was like opening stuff or whatever. And it was like, hey, you need to download these other things, which luckily it'll download for you and you don't have to try to type more things in. So just went ahead and installed both of those or well, three of those. I don't know. The one thing like popped up twice, but it did that every time I tried this. But anyway, so installed both of those and then it opened up the, the wine config menu. And that's good because now wine is all set up. I also opened up the wine file explorer just because I, I don't know. I think I saw something about that you should do that first too before you go to play with anything but I just opened that up too and then closed that. After installing Wine, I went back into the Wine config menu and made sure to have my disk drive get recognized by Wine. So in order to do that, I plugged my disk drive in. This computer does have an internal disk drive, but it doesn't seem to work anymore. So I used my external one and plugged that in, went into the config menu, went into the, um, I don't actually remember what tab it's under, but you guys will see it on the screen, detect all, it detected it. So then that was all set up. And then we're finally ready to actually put the disk of the game into the drive. So now I put the employee of the month disc into the drive and it sort of didn't auto run, but like auto recognized that there was a disc in there. So then after that, clicked on the disc, it opened up, showed me all the files that were on there. Wanted to use auto run because that's like the setup program that seems to usually be the setup program name for most things on a disc. So right clicked on that, opened it with the wine Windows Application Manager or whatever it's called and it seemed to open pretty much fine. It popped up with the little like installer thing. It gives you the options of installing the game and installing DirectX 8. If you try to install DirectX 8 it just crashes uh, the installer or whatever so don't do that. It also isn't actually necessary so don't bother with that. Just install the game and then the game finally was installed. Got to the end of the thing and you know it has a little check mark of do you want to launch the game now and yes. So finally time to play Spongebob. You would think, except for it crashed when I tried to play it. Now, I was so, so confused about why this happened, because yesterday when I did this, I didn't have any issues with this at all. I just did exactly everything I just said, and it worked right from, from this point. But for some reason, it was not actually running. It would, like, half open and then crash. I tried a ton of crap. I tried for multiple hours to get this to work and I could not for the life of me figure out what the heck was causing this to crash when I did the same exact thing as I had done yesterday and it worked fine. I, I reinstalled Ubuntu, reinstalled Wine. I tried like everything that I could think of. I put Wine into like 32-bit mode and everything. Could not get anything to work. And then it hit me. What is the one difference between how I have this set up right now and how I had this set up yesterday when I got it to work? And the answer was my Elgato capture card that I was using to capture the game footage. So I unplugged the Elgato and just plugged the computer right into the into the TV screen. And sure enough, it worked. I even have video of that. It's like recorded hastily on my cell phone, but it shows that it did work when the Elgato capture card wasn't plugged in. Honestly, I don't know what the issue here was because I had the Elgato plugged into my normal computer. I was recording on the normal computer, so it wasn't like that was using any of the processing power of the, the SpongeBob computer or anything. Maybe it could have something to do with resolutions because sometimes changing resolutions don't play nice with like any capture card. I even tried to use my older Elgato on this to see if maybe that would work, but it caused the same thing. So yeah, the Elgato was causing issues with it. But the weird thing about that is that if I unplugged the Elgato, plugged the computer right into the screen, and then started the game, and then plugged the Elgato back in, it would still display the game just at like in a corner of the screen because the resolution's super low because it's an old game. And yeah, so somehow the Elgato ended up wasting like six hours of me troubleshooting this trying to figure it out when in reality all I needed to do was just remove the Elgato from the line of video from the computer to the, to the screen and that fixed it. But anyway, yeah, so if you do this and you don't try to record it with an Elgato, then it should run perfectly fine from the get-go, but 
That was a huge pain to figure out. But anyway, now I have my computer set up and able to play older Spongebob games and probably older other computer games, which is nice. It also kind of taught me a couple things about Linux on the way, which is pretty cool, and sort of how surprisingly well Wine works as a program, because once I did finally get it to play, it doesn't seem to have any issues with playing the game, so that's really cool. And also doing this now, even though it's kind of a pain to figure out how to record it, I think I have it figured out now how to record it after the fact so I might even do some playthroughs of some of these older Spongebob games just because why not they're pretty short and they're they're reasonably good games so yeah that's that I mean this video is more just kind of a cool project thing that I did sort of video also it reminds me I want to make a challenge to any Linux developers out there somebody please make a Spongebob themed distribution of Linux preferably one that comes with like wine and everything re or pre-installed because that that would be that would be really funny but also kind of cool so anyway thanks for watching i totally fumbled through this process but nonetheless still got it to work in the end so yeah thanks for watching and bye bye